Good morning to each one of you and welcome into this Thursday Chapel service. If you were not with us on Tuesday, you missed a very special place in the presence of the Lord and we're still rejoicing in His To have a bit of a different chapel today in the sense that I have the responsibility to preach to you. It is good to have uh, some... Many times we do panel discussions, we've had professors lecture, we bring in guest speakers, we have a host of speakers here on campus. Pointing out some uh, very important information from the book of Acts, and so it may be a bit as the Holy Ghost can do whatever he wants to do, and so we want to stay sensitive to Before we get started this morning, there are several important announcements. We are on the uh, verge of Fall Festival 2023, a wonderful time uh, for families uh, of our UBCA connection to be back on campus. That includes our students, faculty, staff, alumni, parents, donor, uh, donors. Love to have a wonderful, wonderful crowd. And uh, we have reached about 650 for this event for the last couple of years. So would you help me pray for 700 or more? Let's just. As we believe in pressing forward and just seeing God do greater things. It is also a means of fundraising. That's not the primary purpose. I've already disclosed that, but it is a part of the endeavor. And we typically gross about $20,000 in this event. Uh, however, we spend uh, probably more than half of that, and uh, that's okay. That's just what it takes to make that event great, and uh, because our first objective is to give people a wonderful experience on the campus of UBCA, we're happy to do that. ...was to raise the much-needed funding that's uh, required here at Union Bible College and Academy. We're also doing something very easier, so at the booth, that's run by our business office where you can use your credit card or do whatever because you'll be able to use any form of through 300 on it. Each of those numbers will be indicative of a dollar amount. One dollar raising opportunity. Behind those 300 numbers is 100 prizes ranging from free drinks to um, hundreds of dollars worth of uh, credit for great stuff, a couple thousand dollars worth of prizes there. So is to pray and then pledge an amount and then And find the $2 number is still on the board. You pull the $2 number off and win a $20 shirt. Now, if you do that, I want you to do for you, if you haven't found these already, in your mailbox, all of, your, all of you students will find tickets. These tickets are worth $1 a piece. They're for food and drink. They're not for other things. They're for food and drink. But you can take them to any booth and use them that way, and we will replace your typical meals with meals at the event. The phone-a-thon sign-up sheet is being passed around. Is this true? Do we have a phone-a-thon sign-up sheet being passed around? Yes. So please sign up for it. Uh, the lion's share of this work is taking place by our public relations students, and we appreciate their participation so much, but they need your help. And uh, we need to get through our entire database, and that means we're going to have to call multiple times. We want to be friendly. We want to be warm. We want to be genuine and uh, we want to raise a lot of funding and we're trying to raise $40,000 at Phonathon. And this 40,000 underwrites a lot of our internal scholarships like uh, the work scholarship and public relations scholarships. It doesn't make a dent in all of that, but it does, well, that's not, I shouldn't have said that. It doesn't cover entirely all of that, but it does make a wonderful dent. And so it's, it's a wonderful thing. And we would love for you to participate in that uh, by helping us to raise that money. So if you'd call Grandma for us, we're probably more likely to get something. So help us in that event and sign up. 
World Changers Week is on the schedule for October 16th through the 20th. We will just be cleaned up from Fall Fest, and then it'll be time for World Changers Week. And I just want to remind you that this is a closed date, and so you are expected to be here. We're relieving you of your classes, and for that, we are expecting you to be part of the entire event. So please keep that in mind. We are looking at what we can do to make this more streamlined and better for everyone involved, but as of now, October 16th through the 20th. Brother James Plank will be preaching in the evening. Brother Butch Heath will be speaking in the mornings, and then we have others alongside of those men coming in to speak to us about, about the home, uh, the foundation of ministry. And I just want to say that this is an opportunity for our students, faculty, and staff to see us focus in on something that maybe just gets brushed uh, in other arenas. And so right now we are having a complete breakdown of the biblical understanding of the home. And because of that, we're having all kinds of problems flow out of that. And so we're looking to try to address the core issue. And so we look forward to World Changers Week 2023. Sister Janelle Carey needs to meet with all of the ladies that are college or dual credit right after this service for a brief meeting. And if you'll, if you'll be attentive, she will not be long. All right, let's stand together for an opening word of prayer. After which, Brother Clayton Plemons is coming to lead us in singing. We want to make the most of our time together. Let's lift our voices and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. But just now, let's lift our voices together in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege and the power of prayer, the opportunity to come before you in all of our frailty and all of our need, and to lift up our voices, God, with the confidence that you hear and help. We also come before you to give you praise. We bless your name for who you are and all that you do. We come before you with our petition that you would make us what it is that you'd have us be. Bless this service in its entirety. Every song, every testimony, the preaching or teaching of your word, have divine right of way, we pray. We bless you in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Remain standing. Take your hymn and we'll turn to song number 84. Song number 84. We're talking this morning about, we're going to be singing about the grace of God and grace that is, grace that is greater than our sin. And I just want to read some, I just want to read some scripture this morning, uh, Romans, both of these passages will be from Romans, first of all, first of all in ch chapter six, for, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And I think a lot of people today stop right there and take that as their, their free pass to go out and sin. But then the question is asked, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye become the servants of righteousness. Who are we servants to this morning? We're either servants to sin or servants unto grace and unto righteousness. And then Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Moreover, the law entered that the difference might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The amazing grace of God, that sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. We're singing about the amazing grace of God this morning. Let's sing it together. of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mouth outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. 
is the state that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Wider than snow you
play that, sister, if you would, please. We all have our different backgrounds, and that brings a lot of diversity. Not necessarily a right or a wrong, just the uniqueness that we find, the beautiful uniqueness in the body of Christ. And my background is one that this song was scarcely, if ever, sang without some fellowship. Shaking someone's hand, hugging their neck, saying, God bless you, I appreciate you. Because uh, it's a beautiful thing to be part of the family of faith. It's a beautiful thing to be part of the family here at UBCA. It's something that many of us take for granted. And somewhere down the way, when we're in a much different scenario, we'll look back and say, I thank God for those moments. I've had people do the same to me already, people that have been here years and years ago. And so in just a moment, Brother Clayton's going to come back. We're going to sing the last verse, and then we're going to sing, Praise God, Praise God, Praise God. But before that, I want to read Psalms 133. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the Mount of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Let's have a time of fellowship as we sing. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to see. for helping us this morning. You can maybe seat him. I wonder if maybe you're feeling a bit like uh, I am this morning, thankful for the grace of God, recognizing afresh and new the uh, radical change that it makes in a life. And maybe you just want to stand and tell about it. If you do, we want to give you an opportunity to testify. Amen. Yes. Yes, good. Someone else.
Amen. Amen. Well, God help us to have faith that goes beyond that God can. We believe he can. If you believe God can do whatever it is that needs to be done, say amen. amen. But we need more than that, so we pray until we feel confident that God will. You ever had God tell you that he'd do something? But then we need to go beyond that and get to the faith that said God does. God just meets the need, great or small. We're so glad that he does meet the need. Well, we're going to go to God in prayer at this time. And I'm going to ask, uh, well, I was going to ask Brother Jordan Whitaker, but I see him missing in action. And so I'm going to ask Brother Kerry. He's right on the front row and ready for action. Brother Kerry, prepare to come to the platform and help us. Uh, Brother Kerry's going to lead us in prayer. We want to be praying for Fall Festival. We want to be praying for World Changers Week, October 16th through the 20th. Uh, I began a revival next week in North Carolina. I would appreciate your prayers in that. And then I'm just thinking this is fall revival season. So let's be praying for revival wherever it may take place. I also want to remind you that we've been having prayer in the chapel as many as can on Wednesdays. But the carry is heading that up. And it's just a sweet, sweet time. We know that everyone can't always be here. But if you can slip in for any bit of time, we encourage you to do so. And if not, we want you to pray and fast where you are because we desperately need God's help. Uh, each and every day. So Brother Kerry is going to come and lead us. Let's stand together for a time of prayer. Lift your voices with Brother Kerry as he leads us to the throne of grace. Let's all pray together. Father, we thank you today for your faithfulness. Yes, we, we thank you, Lord, that you never fail. We thank you that you're good. And Lord, we love you today. Yes, we do. We're so thankful that you saw fit to save us, to change our lives and Thank you for the price that you paid for our sins. And it's something that so many of us have heard about all of our lives, but may we never take for granted how much you love us and what you've done for us, Lord. And we pray today that you would help us. I pray, Lord, that you'd be with us. I thank you for your presence on this campus. I yes. thank you for how you've yes. been in our midst and how you've worked in, in hearts and lives. And, Lord, more than anything else, we just need your presence. We yes. need your help. We need your blessing. We need your smile of approval on our lives. I pray today for our students. I pray that you'd be with them today. You know the burdens they carry. You know uh, the things that they're facing, each and every one of them. Some of them dealing with things maybe that they wouldn't even tell anyone else, but you know. Lord, I lift them before your throne of grace today. Would you strengthen them? Yeah. Would you encourage them? Would you give them the touch that they need? I pray that you'd work in their situations here and answer prayer. Lord, we're so thankful that you can do what seems impossible, and I pray for every one of them today. Work in their lives, work in their families, work in their situations. And Lord, I pray for those here today that uh, may have spiritual needs, and I pray that you deal with them. Holy Spirit, would you speak to them? You've been so close in our chapel services. You've been so close and met with us, and I pray that you'd speak to them. Help every one of them, Lord, that have a need that they would give their hearts and lives to you. I pray that you'd continue to, to save and to sanctify and to do great things in our midst. Yes, yes. And, Lord, we know that that makes all the difference. I pray, Lord, for fall festival that's coming up. I pray that you'd bless in this, this weekend. And, Lord, I pray that everything that's done would be for your glory yes, yes. and for your honor. I pray that those who uh, come on this campus on Saturday would just sense your presence and to see and just to get a glimpse of what you're doing here at UBCA. May they be blessed in their time here and enjoy their time here. I pray that it would be a, a good time of fellowship together. Would you help every every vendor, every every department, every class that's running a booth? Lord, would you give them the help that they need? Would you help in every part of this? Would you help in the auction? And Lord, we pray that you'd help in the fundraising part of this. We realize that that's important as well. Would you would you help this to be a good fundraiser uh, for UBCA as well? Would you just bless in this, we pray. I pray that you'd help in the, the revival that uh, President Buckler is going to be preaching coming up soon. I pray that you'd bless in that, anoint him and use him, give him the touch that he needs. And Lord, we pray that you touch the rest of this chapel service. And you know what you have planned for us today. Give us open hearts. Give us open minds. And Lord, help us to set aside any distraction, any hindrance that we could hear what you have for us today. May we hear and may we be obedient to you. Lord, for everything you do, we're going to give you praise. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Kerry. Thank you for joining him in prayer. I understand we have a special ladies trio 
that's going to sing for us right now. So let's pray for them as they come and make it easy on them to minister to us.
Thank you, ladies, for that good song, and thank the Lord that it is well with our souls. If it's not, it can be this morning, and we pray here at Union Bible College and Academy that each of our students, faculty, and staff would know that. Well, I want you to turn with me this morning quickly to the book of Acts. We are going to consider today Pentecostal people or residents of the upper room. Pentecostal people or residents of the upper room. Now allow me just a moment to put the context in order. The Bible is quite clear and consistent through the Old Testament, exploring and demanding holiness to the New Testament, clarifying and explaining holiness to us. And the Bible has a clear message of God radically changing our nature so that we become who and what it is that we ought to be. This is found not just in the teaching of the apostles, but it's also retained in the teaching of the fathers of the church. Many times, those outside of our own backgrounds and traditions would say, well, there you know, really was no teaching of this nature early on. But I want to argue that it is rooted deeply in Scripture and has always been consistently propagated among the body of Christ. Now, of course, when we find ourselves in uh, the time of the great revivals, men like John Wesley were instrumental to renew this thought and to add clarification upon it. And one thing that he did was he made connection with the perfection that is demanded in the New Testament. And he clarified that that is a Christian perfection, not an absolute perfection, not an angelic perfection, not even an original human perfection. This is a Christian perfection. It's a perfection of being, not a perfection of doing. It will impact our doing, but it's certainly looking at our motivation, our intent. It's looking at our nature. Has it been radically changed? Now, from this, you and I are familiar with phrases like entire sanctification or the second blessing or whatever the case may be. Wesley did not use that uh, language much if at all he used language like circumcision of the heart uh, Christian perfection perfect love but he began to clarify and emphasize and what he did was he said there's a necessity of a second definite work of grace to take place in the heart of the believer that's seeking for this fullness of the stature of the man or woman of God that we ought to be then there was a man by the name of John Fletcher who Wesley hoped to be his successor and Fletcher went into the book of Acts as we're going to do today and he said wow there is a direct correlation between the baptism of the Holy Ghost and this second encounter with God that we'll just for clarity's sake refer to as entire sanctification they're one and the same now I recognize even in our work today there are folk that will argue semantics and I do not want to get in that argument this morning but I just want to clearly point out that in the progression of understanding of this beautiful doctrine, uh, Brother Fletcher said we've got to make connection to the work of the Holy Ghost because it's so clear throughout the acts of the apostles, which should be the acts of the Holy Spirit, he working in them. And so he tied it to uh, the baptism of the Spirit. And he also helped us to see uh, that we can follow through the book of Acts what's taking place in this early entirely sanctified church. Now, by the time we get to, into the uh, uh, early 1900s, late 1800s, we find ourselves here in America, and we have groups like the Church of the Nazarene, which early on uh, picked up on what Fletcher had said and others had written, and they said, what we have here is a necessity to see a baptism of the Spirit, a personal Pentecost. We need to see that in the hearts and lives of believers. And then they tied that into other scriptures and said, this is what's going to help us to aggressively witness because it's going to grant us power and it's going to grant us purity. And I'll try to show you both of those in scripture in just a moment. And they said, what we need is God to give us this power and this purity. And in doing so, he will eradicate. That is a, lang that is a language that they introduce, which means to remove. It also means to destroy. And if you get theologically tied up in that, come talk to me after service. I'd be happy to try to clarify but the soul is polluted and it is corrupted and it needs to be cleansed purged and purified and so from that the early Nazarene church was even known as the Pentecostal church of the Nazarene some of our early groups was called the Pentecostal bands they used that word not because of some reference to what the 
normal notion is of Pentecostalism in this day or the denominations that associate with that, but with this experience that we find in Acts, and especially in Acts chapter 2. So I'm talking about Pentecostal people or residents of the upper room, if the first is too difficult for you. We're not talking about uh, anything that's tied to that type of movement or notion today. The problem is that movement and that group, and we're not in any way trying to show disdain, but they, had ta they have taken a place of prominence when it comes to this language, and so it wasn't very long till we as a holiness people begin to drop that language from our names and titles and manuals and usage. And uh, I understand the reasoning. However, if we're going to see our people entirely sanctified, we are going to have to have a Pentecostal experience. If you and I are going to have clean hands and a pure heart, we're going to have to go again and trek the steps of the upper room until God comes and does for us what so desperately needs to be done. Everybody wake up and say amen. So let's clarify. What does it mean biblically to be a Pentecostal people or residents of the upper room? And much of the confusion, of course, hinges on the fact that our modern-day Pentecostal brethren have decided to focus on one manifestation of Acts chapter 2, and that is the speaking in tongues, the speaking in a different language. And now they use that as an indicator of, of validity. This is an initial evidence that one has been entirely sanctified. There are several problems with this thinking. It leaves out the other manifestations. It doesn't address them at all, which is an inconsistency. It's also not consistent through the book of Acts as a whole because five times in the book of Acts we see people being filled with, baptized with, or moved upon by the Holy Ghost and they're only speaking in another language two of those five times. Furthermore, the two times in which they do speak, there's always other languages present. So there's a need for other dialects and God is allowing his word to go forward miraculously through the granting of people to speak in a language outside of that which is commonly known as their own. And so there's several problems there. And so what does it really mean to be a Pentecostal people or residents of the upper room? And so here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you two lists. I'm going to give you two lists of seven. I'm going to give you a list of seven things that I think are connected to people prior to Pentecost. Then I'm going to give you a list of seven things that I believe is common among people who have been to a place of personal Pentecost. All right? So you can take that down if you want. First, let's read from Acts chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, and then we'll read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Acts chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, and then Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotus, and Judas the brother of James. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Why do I mention these people? Because if we're going to, if we're going to look at what it means to be Pentecostal people or residents of the upper room, don't you think we ought to look to the people that had the experience and the people that spent time in the upper room? What did that look like? Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost to begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And of course, I'd never skirt away from scriptures, and I did not skirt away from verse 4, where these people are given the ability to speak in other known languages that the fulfillment of this prophecy, chapter 1, verse 8, might come to pass and they might have the power to help promote the gospel in a way that's radically greater than before. But our Pentecostal friends have picked up with that and gone an entirely different route. So how do you and I stay bound to the book? How do we stay squarely scriptural this morning? Well, we understand what it is to be Pentecostal people or residents of the upper room. So what did these folk look like prior to Pentecost? The first thing I want you to see, they were a chosen company. A chosen company. Acts chapter 1 verse 1, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. Verse 2, After that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. 
before they ever came into this great experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, of Christian perfection, of perfect love, of entire sanctification, they were already a chosen company. Secondly, they were acquaintances of the Almighty. Acquaintances of the Almighty. Acts chapter 1 verse 3. To whom also he shewed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And verse 4 says being assembled together with them commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father which saith he ye have heard of me. This chosen company was acquainted with the Almighty. They were keeping company with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords through the person of Jesus Christ. This was prior to Pentecost. This was prior to a second definite experience with God. They were a chosen company. They were acquaintances of the Almighty. Number three, they were privileged people. Acts chapter 1 verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. Verse 5, for John truly baptized with water, but ye should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. This chosen company that was acquainted with the Almighty had the privilege to receive the promise. Terry, because you are going to be endued with power, I am going to give unto you this great experience that's necessary to radically cleanse your nature and change your nature and make it what it ought to be. This is prior to Pentecost. These are people that are chosen, acquainted, and privileged. Number four, they are a compliant crowd. A compliant crowd. Acts chapter 1 verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. Well, we understand now by what we have already read in Acts chapter 2 that they were compliant to that command and they did exactly what God told them to do. By the way, you'll have to do the same thing. Everybody say amen. This is prior to Pentecost. Are you noticing these very important points? This is a chosen company, acquaintances of the Almighty, a privileged people, a compliant crowd prior to Pentecost. Number five, they are a patient people, a patient people. And being assembled together with them, he commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait, wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. Oh, I want so much for you to have a hunger and a thirst. That was championed in Tuesday Chapel. But I also want you to marry that hunger and that thirst with a patient waiting on the Lord, a tarrying, expecting God to do. That's what we find in Acts chapter 2. They tarried in the upper room because God keeps his promises. Everybody say amen. And they were going to wait as long as it took for God to bring that to pass. This is prior to Pentecost. Number six, there are people of prayer. A people of prayer. Acts chapter 1, verse 13. And when they were come in, they went up into the upper room where abode Peter and James and John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotus, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren. Prior to Pentecost, a chosen company, acquaintances with the Almighty, privileged people, compliant crowd, patient people, people of prayer. And seventh and finally, prior to Pentecost, they were a faithful few. Acts chapter 1 verse 15, a faithful few. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of the names together were about 120. Now to understand the context of that, We've got to go back and recognize that in the Gospels we heard that Jesus post-resurrection was seen of more than 500 brethren at one time. But when it comes to fulfilling this command, being that chosen company, acquaintances with the Almighty, that privileged people, that compliant crowd, that patient people, that people of prayer, that was a faithful few, only 120 of the 500 or more that saw him. But I want you to see this was the state of these folk prior to Pentecost. I'm pausing just long enough to make this very practical point. There's many of you and many among our people that are trying to seek God for a sanctified heart when they haven't even come into a right relationship with God, meeting the criteria of what it takes to become Pentecostal people or residents of the upper room. That's what they look like before. How about these seven things that we see in them afterwards? Number one, Coming out of the upper room, these Pentecostal people, these residents of the upper room were baptized believers. 
Acts chapter 1 verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Chapter 2 verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I'm glad God does what he says he'll do. And if you'll meet the conditions, God will provide the provision. Number two, they're not just baptized believers, but they're powerful people. Powerful people. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. And in Samaria. And unto the uttermost parts of the earth. By the way. Just so you don't get hung up like our Pentecostal brethren do today. When it says they all spake with other tongues. Verse 4. Go to verse 6 of chapter 2. Now when this was noised abroad. The multitude came together and were confounded. Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. This is not a confusing thing. God is enabling this people to have the power to present the gospel. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. They're not just baptized believers and powerful people when they come out of the upper room. But they are a holy host. A holy host. Acts chapter 1. Verse 5, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 8, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is a holy host of people. Now I am going to pause and say so that we don't mistake things. They were holy. Before they enter the upper room. A chosen company. Acquaintances of the Almighty. Privileged people. Compliant crowd. Patient people. People of prayer. The faithful few. They were already holy. Called from sinner to sainthood. From death to life. But this word baptize is the word baptizo. And it means to be submerged. It means to be immersed. It is God's spirit overtaking you. And filling every nook and cranny of you if you will. And thank God. You cannot be overtaken by the Holy One in that way and not become a Holy One yourself. Everybody's still awake. Say amen. They're not just baptized believers, powerful people, and a holy host, though. When they come out of the upper room, they are witnesses to the world. Witnesses to the world, number four. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. I want you to recognize, and I won't take the time, but if you would go to verse 7 of Acts chapter 2 and read through verse 11, you would have a complete and explicit explanation of what took place with the gifting of other languages in verse 4 and the amazement that it caused in verse 6. These folk are going to be witnesses unto the world. If you are residents of the upper room, if you're true Pentecostal people, I promise you this, you will be an effective witness to the world. Number 5, these are purified people purified people acts chapter 2 verse 3 and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it set upon each of them verse 4 and they were all filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance i only brush the reference to fire here but to have clarity we would have to go to acts chapter 15 and we would have to look at verses 8 and 9 peter says but god knoweth the hearts and bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. He put no difference between us, the Jews, and them, the Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. This is a baptized bunch of believers, powerful people, a holy host, witnesses to the world, purified people. That's what they look like coming out of the upper room. Number six, they are filled folks. Filled folks. Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You know what I've often said, and I think it may be very grassroots, but I think it's illustrative enough that you can see it. Old time religion is like a shook up can of pop. There's so much pressure down on the inside, it's going to spew out every time it gets a chance. And can I tell you, we desperately need a people that's so full of Him. People that have been in the upper room, residents of the upper room. People that's had a real personal Pentecost, Pentecostal people that are so filled with him that they're ready to spill out on everybody else. That's what's happening in verse 4. Seventh and finally, coming out of the upper room, they are a proclaiming people. They begin to declare. I could use the same verse again, verse 4. They begin to declare. But let's go 
to verse 17 and 18. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. After the upper room, what's it look like to be Pentecostal people, residents of the upper room? They're baptized believers. They're powerful people. They're a holy host. They're witnesses to the world. They're purified people. They're filled folks. They're proclaiming people. And by the way, if you have a personal Pentecost, that will be the same case for you. God, help us not to settle for something less than the blood of Jesus Christ was shed to provide. God, help us not to settle for anything less than a real, biblical, scriptural, personal Pentecost. Let us know what it is to be entirely sanctified. So I hope you got your list this morning. If you didn't, that's your mistake. I'll still share it with you because I'm just uh, gracious. But uh, I hope that you got it because it'll help you. A lot of people are trying to get in the upper room when they haven't met the conditions. And a lot of people are coming out of the upper room saying, I'm a Pentecostal person. I've had a personal Pentecost when they don't show the evidence, the true evidence of what that looks like. And so let me just close with this. Not everyone is ready for the upper room. And not everyone is a resident of the upper room. And so I want to know, are you? Are you a resident of the upper room? Do you know what it is to be a Pentecostal person in a biblical reality? Or are you not even ready because you haven't met conditions that have to be put in place before we can go before the Lord and tarry? until we be endued with power from on high. Stand with me. Father, bless this truth to our hearts. Help us to have biblical, scriptural experiences. And let us, Lord God, live in such a way that others can look to you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies, remember, remember that you have a short meeting with Sister Carrie. So